Hello, my name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for SAT. We have been solving SAT math problems out of this book here, the SAT Official Study Guide 2020. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. You must have the book in front of you at all times. Today we'll solve some problems that you will find on page number 463. Page 463, we're going to begin with number 14. Number 14 and 15 are the last two last two problems left that are left in the multiple choice sections of that of that section. We talked about them yesterday, they are hard ones. So 14 and 15 are going to take some time. And then after that, we're going to go on to the grading question. Let's take a look at it. Number 14, as you can see, is already on the blackboard. We are given two inequality. We are given two inequality, and our job is simply to identify the correct shaded region among the four that are there. Okay, let's begin. If at the end of the video you find it helpful and you decide that you would like to work with me, that you would like to hire me as your tutor to get you ready for the exam, you can always get hold of me at Kishwani Prep at iCloud.com. Send me an email, or you can just visit my website. Let's begin. So the trick here is this: even though, even though we are given two inequality. It's always a good idea. It's always a good idea to start with a simple equality. Don't worry about inequality. We'll get to that in a second. So let's look, let's, let's write down this in the form of an equality, and now we can just, we're just going to plot it. Keep it very simple. Just use the just use the intercept x intercept and y intercept. Keep it very simple. So when x is equal to zero, y is two. X is zero along y axis, so y is two. There we go. That's the first point right here. And then when y is 0, when y is 0, x is going to be negative 2. When you bring the 2 over there, it's very simple. x is going to be negative 2. There you go, we have our line. That's the first, in that's the first, first inequality, we're just going to call it L1. So well, this is L1. Now we have to determine which, which side, which poor region it belongs to, whether it's the upper region or lower region. And the trick that I use is very simple. The trick that I use when I'm doing this kind of problem is sort of memorizing things. There's a very simple trick. Just take the origin. Just take the origin. It's very simple. And test it out. See where it falls. We, we are told that y is equal to x plus 2. That's what we just parted. And now that, it's, now that the line is parted, we want to see if this quantity is indeed greater than or equal to x plus 2. We're not, we're not interested in the equal to part because if it's equal to, it's going to fall right on the line. That's not going to do it much good. We want to see if y is greater than x plus 2, use that point here, see what happens. So here, they're both 0, 0 is greater than 0 plus 2, is it? Of course not, 0 is not greater than 0 plus 2, which means this point does not belong in the solution region. It doesn't belong there, because if it did belong there, this would have worked. Which means we're dealing with this region right here, we're dealing with upper region. We're dealing with the upper region, that's all it is, that's how simple it is. And if you want to feel safe, now this is something that I'm about to do. It's not something necessary during the exam because we already did it and, it, and we already know what, what solution region is. But right now, if you want to feel a little bit safe, pick one more point. Any point would do here. Any point, any point will do here uh, uh, in the upper region because now this one tells us that we are in the upper region. Try it out and see if it, for example, here. Any point, as I said. How about, I want to keep it simple. How about, how about negative 2 and positive 2? Now that thing should tell us that it works. Let's see, very quickly, okay, negative 2 and positive 2. So here, y, and here, we have negative 2 and a positive 2. So positive 2, it says greater than negative 2 plus 2. You see, this is our x plus 2. And negative plus 2 is 0, and the positive 2 is indeed greater than 0. You see, it works. Now let's do the other one. Simple enough. Now we'll work on the second one. I'm going to pick up a little bit of speed. L2, the second line right here. 2x plus 3y. And again, we're going to start out with the equality to keep it simple. When x is equal to 0, 3y is equal to 6. If 3y is equal to 6, y must be 2. So when x is equal to 0, x is 0 along y axis. And what did I say here? 3y, 3y is equal to 6, y is equal to 2. Oh, right here. Actually, they share the point. They share that point. And then the next one is going to be when y is 0, when y is 0, 
2x is going to be equal to 6 and x is equal to 3. So when y is 0, y is 0 along x-axis and x is equal to 3. 1, 2, 3 right here is the second point. Let's do it in a different color so we can differentiate L1 and L2. Voila. This is our L2. Again we're going to use the same we're going to use the same trick. Let me let me make it a little bigger here, a little bit longer. Well you get the idea. I want you to make it longer. I want you to make this line a little bit longer because I already know what the solution region is and I wanted to emphasize it. So that's it, we have the line. Let's try the origin again. Let's do the test of origin and see what happens. So here we are told that this quantity has to be less than or equal to. So let's put in less than or equal to. Again, we are interested in the less than part, not the equal to part. Let's put in 0, 0. When x is 0 and y is 0, right here, 0 is less than or equal to 6. Less than or equal to 6. Well, that works. That works, which means we're trying to figure out, you see, this is the line here. And we're trying to figure out, is the solution region upper half or is it the lower half? And we just found out that it is indeed lower half because when we put the origin, it satisfies the inequality. It is the lower half. Let me do it in a different color. This is the lower half. I'm going to put it right there. That's it. And again, one more time, if you wanted to feel safe, if you wanted to feel safe, we could have chosen one more point. How about right here? Point right here. And you will see that it will not work. This one would be 3, 3, 2. And that would not work. You will try it out and you will see that it will not work. If you do 3, 2, you can immediately see that that quantity is going to be much larger than 6. 2 times 3 is already 6. And 3 times 2 is not less than or equal to 6. Which means that point does not belong in a solution region. So solution region is the bottom part. And now we see where the, where the, where the common area is. Common area is right here. This right here is the common area. There you go. This is what we're looking at. This is our solution region. This is where they overlap. That's where they overlap and that is what I'll choice. That looks like it's also choice B to me. That looks like also choice B. That was it. That was number 14. Let's move on to number 15. Number 15 is another tricky one. We're going to have to talk about it for a second before we dive into it. It's always a good idea not to go around memorizing everything like a parrot. Just do it out. It only takes a few seconds and it shows that you understand the concept. Started when they give you the, when they ask you to plot inequality, they start with equality, which is very simple, very straightforward. Draw the line with the x coordinate and the, uh, rather x x intercept and y intercept. Always use x intercept and y intercepts. Makes life easier. Draw the line and just pick a point, any point. And I typically pick the origin because I'm lazy. Because you put the origin, they both become zero. You can very easily see if it works or not. Okay, number fifteen. Number 15 says that x plus 2 is equal to negative x. Before I dive into this thing, I want to share something with you. Here, we are dealing with the same situation. Here, I'm going to write the entire thing down. We are dealing with the same situation. as the one we encountered as, as one we encountered on page 337 number 14 on day 2 and I told you to read in the book in the, in the back of the book where the answer choices are I ask you to read at that point at that point I ask you to read page 408 <coughs> under, under explanation and I want you to redo that thing just to remind you, refresh your memory and now that I have written everything down I'm going to erase it because you already have it so here we are dealing one more time we are dealing with the same situation as the one that we encountered on page number 337 number 14 
Do you notice something? Number 14, number 15, they appear in the same area, in the higher area of the 15 multiple choice question. It's a very simple concept and yet a lot of people get it wrong because they just don't know it. It's not difficult. Once you know it, it's very simple. So we're going to talk about it, okay? Here we go. The concept that we're dealing with here, concept that we're dealing with here is what is known as principal root. And I'm going to quote quickly explain to you what a principal, what principal root means. For example, when you're dealing with numbers, for example, if somebody comes up to us and asks us, what's the square root of 9? If somebody walks up to us and asks us, what's the square root of 9? Of, co of course, the correct answer is square root of 9. Eh? Square root of 9 could be either a positive 3 or a negative 3. Because both positive 3 and negative 3 squared will give us back what we're looking for, which is 9. Because when, when we're asking somebody what's the square root of 9, the question that is being asked here is, listen carefully, when somebody asks us what's the square root of 9, the question that, being, that is being asked here is, what is that number which, when multiplied by itself, gives us 9? What is that number which, when multiplied by itself, gives us 9? And here, there are two such numbers. 3 is such a number. 3, when multiplied by itself, is going to give us 9. Negative 3 when multiplied by itself, negative 3 times negative gives us 9. You all, know, you know all of this thing, I'm making too much fuss about nothing. But the point here is there are two roots. Now, like, let's take a look at a situation like this. I'm just going to make something up, you understand? I'm just going to make something up, how about, how about, uh, give me a second, I have to think, okay? Okay, there we go. Now, instead of solving the entire thing, I'm going to tell you what the answer is because I just made it up in my mind. The answer here is x is 7. x is 7. Now watch what happens. 7 plus 3 is 9. And if somebody were to ask her in an ordinary case, without this, without this part being there, oh, uh, rather I should erase that part. That's, if, without the top part being there, if somebody simply asks us what's the score of 9, the correct answer is indeed positive 3 or negative 3. But here, we cannot have both. It has to be one or the other. The other type tells me that x is 7, 7 minus 3 is 4. It is the positive 4. In a situation like this, when you have a, in the square root sign an algebraic expression, one more time, under the square algebraic equation, algebraic equation like this, we are always dealing with what is known as the principal root. In other words, we ignore the negative root. It has to be positive quantity. This, this, this thing has to be the principal root of this thing is what we're looking at. The principal root of this thing. In other words, whatever the positive root of this quantity is, that's what we're dealing with. We're not dealing with negative root. And if we understand that part, that's all we need to know. Now we can begin our process. And which is exactly what happened previous time on page number 337, as I said earlier. Let's begin. We have talked too much already. Let's, let's square both sides. That's the first step. Let's square both sides. When we square both sides, we end up with x plus 2 on this side. It's very straightforward. And here, square of negative x is going to be x squared. Okay, let's, let's, finish. let's finish it up now. Bring everything on the other side. We're going to end up with x squared minus x plus 2 is equal to 0. We're looking for two numbers whose product has to be positive 2 and whose difference has to be negative 1. And two such numbers, I think it's negative 2x and negative x. There you go. Negative, negative 2 times negative 1 is going to give us positive 2. That is not what I have in my book. And that's not going to work because negative 2x and negative x is going to give us negative 3x. Did I make a mistake? Yes, I made a mistake. I made a mistake because when we bring the 2 to the other side, it becomes a negative 2. Now it would work. And since we want a negative here, the negative has to belong to the bigger number. We're looking, we're looking for something like this. Negative 2x and a positive x is going to give us negative 2x squared. And negative 2x plus an x is going to give us negative x. Minus 2 equals 0. I'm going to pick up speed. If you're looking at these two terms here, the, the common term is x. We take out x, we get x minus 2. And here, between this term and that term, we have, we have nothing in common. In other words, we only have one in common. And we end up with x minus 2 equals 0. And x minus 2 is equal and I know, I know this is not how you're taught in the American school. You're taught, I don't know, for some strange reason to go from here to here. I have no idea how the bloody hell you guys do that. It just makes no sense. 
there is a process. There is a process. And that's the process which tells us that x has to be either positive 2 or x has to be negative 1. So don't, jump, don't jump your gun and start saying that x is positive 2 because I just told you the root is positive 2. The root is positive 2. That does not necessarily mean that x is positive 2. We have to go back here and see what happens. If you put in positive 2, what, what is going to happen? If you put in positive 2, remember, the equation that was given to us is this. So what we are trying to see here is which one works. Does positive 2 work or negative 2 work? Remember, this quantity has to take a positive root, principal root only. So if you put in 2 here, we end up with 2 plus 2, and the principal root of this thing is, is positive 2. And on this side, we have negative x, negative of positive 2, it's negative 2. As you can see, it does not work. It does not work. On the other hand, if we try the negative one, it will work. It has to work, because obviously one of those two has to work. Let's try it. If we put in negative 1, we end up with negative 1 and a positive 2, which is square root of 1, and we take a principal root, which is 1, positive 1 that is. And here on this side, we have negative x, and since we're trying negative 1, what we have here is negative of negative 1, which is indeed positive 1. It works beautifully. So the answer to this question is negative 1. x is equal to negative 1, and which is why a lot of people are going to get it wrong. The answer here is b. answer here is b. a is wrong. a is the wrong answer, because as we can see, as, as we saw a little while ago, x equal to positive 2 does not work. It doesn't work because the principal root is what we're dealing with here, which means we're only looking for the positive root. Well, enough of that. Give me a little break and we'll go to the next part. The next three questions that we're going to deal with are gradient, gradient questions, and there are five of them in the exam, in this section. There are five of them, which tells me that the first two or three should be fairly easy. They should go very fast. It is only the last two where we'll have to slow down. The first three, two or three will go very fast. Number 16, number 16 says, what's the volume of right rectangular prism. The only reason, the only reason why anybody would get this question wrong is because perhaps they have trouble as to what the hell, what the hell they meant by rectangular prism. A rectangular prism is a very annoying way of saying, is saying a rectangular box. That for the prism. It's, it's a, it happens to be a prism, but it's in the shape of a rectangular box. Simple rectangular box is what we're dealing with. It just happens to be a prism. That's all. That's a box. And how do you find the volume of a rectangular box? Volume of a rectangular box is simply length times width times height. And that's all it is. And they give us the three dimensions. They tell us, they tell us the length is 4, 4 cm. They tell us the width is 9 cm. And they tell us the height is 10 cm. 4 times 9 is 36. 36 times 10 is going to be 360. So it's 360 cubic centimeter. Because all of these are measured in, in terms of centimeter. And that's all it is. Next one, number 17. Number 17 tells us that 4x plus 2 is equal to 4. And the question is this, I'm, I'm going to write it twice, but I have no choice. The question is, how much is this quantity? Now, you can go, you could go about solving for x, which is not a big deal here. But notice this and this, you should see something, you, something should click. If we divide this entire equation, if we divide the entire equation by 2, we'll end up with that. 4x divided by 2 is 2x, 2 divided by 2 is 1, and 40. There you go, there is your answer. The question was how much is 2x plus 1? The answer is it is 2. That's what you're going to grade in. You're going to grade in 2. Number 18. Number 18 is asking us 
Number 18 false force tells us the g of x we are creating a new function from the function that is given to us the picture of the function that is given to us which is f of x and g of x we are told is f of x plus 6 in other words whatever the value of the function f is for each given value of x for each given value of x whatever the value of the function f is and g is just 6 more than that you're just picking up the bloody thing and moving it six, six units up, that's all it is. And this is what it looks like. Before we go any further, before we ask ourselves what the question is, this, I'm going to do my best here. It doesn't have to be accurate. Right here is the maximum. Right here is the maximum. The maximum occurs at 0, 2. And the question is, what's the maximum value of G? Well, as you can see, as you can see, the maximum value of f of x from the graph you can clearly see the maximum value of f of x is two, and therefore, therefore, the maximum value of g of x is simply two plus eight. I don't know why I'm making so much fuss about it. That's all. Well, not two plus eight, rather two plus six. Two plus six, and therefore the answer is eight. That's what you want to create in. Number 19. Now we're getting in the last two. Let's see what we have in the last two. Oh. Where is 19? Oh, actually. It says we have a triangle, triangle PQR, we are told, has right angle at Q. So let's draw triangle PQR. So we know this has to be Q, because they tell us that. And where we put where we put P or Q or P or R, it really doesn't matter. It's up to us. It makes no difference. So I'm just going to say P, Q, R. Just go uh, anti-clockwise. I'm just going anti-clockwise, or as you guys like to call it, counterclockwise. Where I come from, we call it anti-clockwise. So, where was I? What else we are told? We must have been told something. Well, we also told that the sine of r, sine of r is 4 over 5. So since we have now sine of, sine of r, there you go, this is r, and sine of course is opposite over hypotenuse. So the opposite of this thing is this, 4 over 5. 5 of course is the, is the hypotenuse. That's all. So this is 4, this is 5. I hope you are able to see immediately, I hope that you are able to see immediately without having to do work. That we're simply dealing with the 3, 4, 5 triangle. We're simply dealing with the 3, 4, 5 triangle. Q to R is 3. Now let's see what they're asking. They're asking for the tangent of P. Tangent of P obviously is simply opposite over adjacent. I hope you know your I hope you know your so cut one. Everybody knows it. So tangent tells me that it's opposite over adjacent opposite of uh, tangent of P. Where is P? Right here is the P. This is what we're dealing with. The opposite is 3. Opposite is 3. And adjacent is 4. Adjacent side is 4. There you go. So the answer to this question is 3 quarter. Answer number 19 is 3 quarter. Last one. Number 20. So 19 wasn't that bad either. Perhaps it's the number 20 that is going to give us hell. Who knows? Number 20 says that the graph of f of x is given. So let's draw that. That's right, it's given to us. We are told that it goes through. 1, 2, 3, it goes through 3 and 1, 1. 
it goes through exactly one one. One, two, three, and one one is going somewhere here. It goes through right here. Let's let's call it L1. The the function the graph for fx we're gonna call it L1, which is simply f of x. Do you understand? Now let's read the rest. We are told that we have another function g of x. We are told that we have another function g of x, whose uh, that does not appear in the in, in the in the in the problem. It actually says in the parentheses not shown, because as soon as as soon as I say the graph of the linear function g of x, obviously people start looking for it, and that's why they tell you in the parentheses it's not shown. It is something that people have to produce, and we are told that we have a g of x that is perpendicular. f of x and and passes through 1 3 so right now what we're doing is incorporating everything that is that is being told to us we haven't begun the solution yet we're just incorporating everything that we have so it has to go through 1 3 and it is sitting at a right angle to f of x let's do that 1 3 1 3 right here somewhere 1 3 it has to go it has to go through here and it has to be at the right angle so let's see we'll do our best we'll do our best there you go it looks to me like something like this right here like that there you go it goes through it goes of course in the real exam you don't have to do any of this bull crap you understand i'm just doing it to teach you you just have to process in your mind what's going on let's call this l2 what is the question actually? What is the bloody question? Here is the question. The question is what's the value of what's the value for g of 0? There you go. That's what it is. In a very, very roundabout way, all they are telling to all they are telling us is that we, we are going to give you a function, a line, a line that is clearly marked here. We can very easily figure out the equation of that line. So all they are telling you is that we are giving you a line, find out the equation for the line that is perpendicular to it, because if you give you the line, you can find the slope of that line, and once you have the slope of that line, you can figure out the slope of the other line, and we are giving you one point through which this second line goes through. So you will have the one point, you can figure out the slope, you can figure out the equation of the other line, and once you have the equation of the other line, just figure out what a, what a g of 0 is. That's all it is. So let's do that. So, so far we have not done any solution. So far all we have done is produce everything that is given in the problem. Let's begin the solution. Now, because g of x is perpendicular to f of x, I'm going to erase now. We are, we are going to begin the solution now. We know it passes through 1, 3 right here. Let's make a note of it. This is 1, 3 right here. 1 and 3. It goes through that point. And what we're trying to figure out is g of x, or rather g of 0. Okay. Since g of x is perpendicular to f of x, that means that the product, this implies, so, so we, we have begun the solution, do you understand? That implies that the product of their, of their slopes, of their slopes, must equal negative 1. That's what it means. That's what it means when the two lines are perpendicular, which means the slope of line 1 times the slope of line 2 must equal negative 1. Let's figure out what the slope of line 1 is. Slope of line 1 we can figure out very easily because we have the two points that it goes through. So we're trying to figure out the slope of line 1, m1 let's call it, change in y over change in x. And I'm going to use obviously this point right here which is 1, 2, 3, uh, 0, 3. And this point right here, which is 1, 1. Okay, let's call them A, B. Okay, so follow, follow, follow as I speak. So we're just, going to, we're just going to do A minus B. So change in Y. Y coordinate of A is 1. This is where you have to pay attention because it's very easy to make a mistake. Change in Y. So 1 minus 3. 1 minus 3. And now the change in X. 1 minus 0. 1 minus 0. 1 minus 3 is negative 2, and that's what next. There you go, it's negative 2, it's just negative 2. Now we have m1, we can figure out the m2. 
m1 times m2 we know has to equal negative 1. How do we know that? Because that is, that is the fact, that's an axiom, that is true always. m1 we know is negative 2 times m2 has to equal negative 1. Okay, let's continue. Let's divide both sides by negative 2. Let's divide both sides by negative 2. We end up with negative 1 over negative 2, which is simply half. That is our m2. Now we know the slope of the other line. Now we know the slope of the other line. We also know the other line goes through 1, 3. So now we're going to use this equation. When we know a, when we know the slope of a given line and we know the coordinates of one of the points that it goes through, we can use this form of the equation. I don't know what you call it. It goes something like this. y minus y1 has to equal m times x minus x1. I have no idea what you guys have named for it, but that's what it is. I'm sure it has a name for it. Point slope form? Yeah, exactly. It's the point slope format. I think the bloody thing is called point slope format because one requires a point and one requires a slope in order to be able to use it. So let's do that. y minus y1, we are using this point right here. This is the point we are looking talking about right here. So y is 3, y coordinate is 3. And m, we've just found out, is half. And x minus x1, and x1, the x coordinate is 1. There you go. Which in turn implies that y must equal this whole quantity Technically, it will look better if I line it up properly. It will look more elegant if you line up the equal signs. So you're going to have so that everything lines up and it's easy on the eyes. This quantity itself, I'm going to erase this thing. We're done with it. This quantity itself, and then bring the three to the other side. Bring the three to the other side, and at this point, that's all you need here. Don't waste your time trying to refine it, trying to make it more elegant. We don't really care about it. All we want to find out is the value of, value of the function and x is 0. So let's find it out. So y of 0, which is same as g of 0 obviously, because the, the name of this function is g, is simply 1 half times x is 0. 0 minus 1 plus 3. That's all we need, which is why you don't have to waste your time refining it. It's not necessary. So 1 times negative 1 is negative 1. Negative 1 over 2, which is negative half, plus the 3. 3 minus a half is simply 2 and a half. It's simply 2 and a half. The answer here is 2 and a half, but we cannot grade in, we cannot grade in 2 and a half. It, the format of the exam does not allow us to grade in mixed fraction. So we have two choices here. You can either grade this in as improper fraction, 5 over 2 if you like, or if you prefer you can grade it in as 2.5. Either this one or this format would work. Do not try to grade in, do not try to grade in 2, 1, slash, and 2, because the computer is going to read this as not as 2 and a half, it's going to read that as 21 over 2. Don't do that. We cannot grade in this format. We cannot grade in mixed fraction. It has either has to be in the form of an improper fraction or a decimal. That was the other story. We finished this section. I'll see you tomorrow and we'll pick up from where we left off. In the next section, we'll move on to. Again, if you wish to get hold of me, you can always reach me by sending me a simple email at kashmaniprep at icloud.com and we'll see what we can do. All right? I hope this video wasn't too long. I'll, I'll find out in a second when I go in the back. Bye now.